Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of The Sound of Broken Ribs by Edward Lorne. Edward Lorne is a fellow booktuber. I've previously read uh, Life After Dane for obvious reasons, and I did enjoy that one. I enjoyed this one as well. Um, I will go. I will give you the blurb and uh, check out my tabs and give you my rating at the end. I also picked this one up because my girlfriend Shay picked up uh, Life After Dane and really enjoyed it. She said it's one of the best books she's ever read, and I wanted to, you know, show some more indie love while simultaneously kind of encouraging Shay to do a bit more reading as well. So I picked up another Edward Lawn and I picked up The Sound of Broken Ribs because it has an incredible title. So let's go in and check out the blurb. Dane reads. Lee Duncan has it all. The ideal life, the perfect career, a loving husband. What more could someone ask for? It is with this in mind that Lee takes her morning run, oblivious to everything ahead. Belinda Walsh has lost it all, her home, her husband, her mind. She thought she knew Dan, but one phone call changed all that. Now everything she's known to be true is a lie. It is with this in mind that she goes looking for something or someone to destroy. When the lives of two strangers intersect, something will be born of the connection. For one of these two souls, the truth of the world will shift and morph into something powerful and dangerous, a darkness of the mind, a tear in sanity. And something will peek through that darkness, beckoned by the sound of broken ribs. Dun dun dun. So, some tabs. So this main character, uh, Belinda, is it Belinda? Lee, it's Lee Duncan, she's an author. Um, and she, she finishes a book, so we get... She grabbed her cell phone from where it lay next to the laptop. She texted Harry two words. I'm done. The excitement present in that text was not shared by its sender. She never got happy after the completion of a rough draft. That would be like celebrating snagging the World Cup after winning the first game of the season. There were multiple drafts left to do. Once the book was constructed to her liking, she'd send it to her beta readers to find out if she'd done a decent job of telling the story. If they liked it, she'd do one last self-edit before sending it to her publisher. After that, copy editing and proof approvals, and holy shit was she tired of the process. Just thinking about it exhausted her. Yeah, welcome to the club. You can tell Ed's uh, a writer from that. Ed? Edward. We got this little line which I thought was funny because this is certainly true of me. Retard, she said to an empty room. Like most people, her political correctness was non-existent while in the privacy of her own home. And here we get a reference to the title which was called uh, Leah's Been Hit By A Car. Coughing without being able to control her jaw was a horrible experience. Every time she hacked, her fractured mandible ground together. Then she'd inhale and her chest would clickety-click-click, and if she hadn't been in so much agony, she might have found it oddly funny. She was a living musical instrument. Call her one-woman band, The Sound of Broken Ribs. And I just thought this was funny. Again, this is very much a booktube thing. I feel like Edward was uh, inspired by watching unboxings. Belinda's brother Tony was an odd duck, at least she thought so. His ranch house was littered with empty boxes from various monthly subscription outlets, cult crate, geek block, non-box, and even more. Belinda calculated that given the variety of packages, Tony must spend upwards of 200 bucks a month on his subscriptions. He wasn't a hoarder, not yet anyway. But it was hard to move around his living room without stepping or sitting on a box of some kind. And Belinda says, I can't drink coffee, makes me anxious. And that kind of was a problem for me for a little while. I am back to now being able to enjoy coffee, but it does play with my anxiety because it affects your heart rate, you know? So Belinda Walsh ends up making lemonade here and I just thought this was interesting. When life hands you lemons, you make lemonade. So that's what Belinda Walsh did, she made lemonade. She stood at the sink grinding lemons into the stationary drill-like point of the juice that she'd found in Tony's cupboard. The plastic dish was bright, traffic cone orange. It made the juice she extracted from the lemons look like infected urine. Trying not to think about such things, she poured the juice of five lemons into a pitcher she'd preemptively filled to the brim with ice. Then she added two cups of sugar and tap water until the liquid rose to the rim of the pitcher. Like freshly squeezed anything, it didn't match the over-sugared products one could buy at their local grocery store, but it was refreshingly tart. Did a great job of brightening her mood anyway. And we get this sort of horrific thing that tells us a lot about Belinda's upbringing. At least the beatings had been separated by gender. Dad had beaten Tony and Mum had beaten Belinda. She wasn't exactly sure why she felt that gender specific beatings were better, but Belinda assumed it had to do with how her father sometimes looked at her, especially after she'd met Aunt Flo and sprouted her very own pair of sweater puppies. She vividly recalled one evening when she'd been readying herself for a shower and Dad walked in unannounced. He'd apologised and retreated, but his eyes had scanned her one good time before he left her to consider how lavicious his perusal had been of his daughter's body. She thought he'd enjoyed what he'd seen. Her own father had found her attractive. Okay, so Lee's got a uh, uh, tube down her throat as she's recovering. It took a considerable amount of effort to peel her tongue from the roof of her mouth. The taste inside her gob could only be described as used kitty litter and coffee grounds. 
And here Belinda's thinking about what makes a woman a woman. In her opinion, what made a woman weak in the eyes of a man was their mousy, timid nature. Men respected strength and bravado and braggadocio. They respected what they understood and feared the unknown. Because women acted differently, were held to a different standard, they were mysterious creatures to men. And men, in all their stunning intellect, did one of two things to life forms they could not fathom. Fucked or killed them. Sometimes they did both. And here's a term I've not heard before, Irish twins. Kids like Anthony and Belinda Marchesini were what some people called Irish twins. They were not twins, not even in the fraternal sense. The term is meant to imply back-to-back -back pregnancies, pop one bun out of the oven and stuff another right in after it. In total, Tony was 11 months and 8 days older than his sister. In experience, he was decades her senior. We know that uh, one of Lee's, Lee's favorite, current favorite word is fuck trumpet. What a glorious pairing of words that was. A great little line here. If small towns were capable of nothing else, they were capable of keeping secrets. And we get this, uh, Jenna, who's the cop, she arrives at house. Jenna wasn't an expert in the field of architecture, but she was pretty sure this kind of one-story home with half a porch and bay windows was called a bungalow. There was a small garden to the left, the side without a porch, under the bay window. The curtains were tied open and Jenna could see a quaint little nook set up with decorative pillows. The peaks of the throws had a patina of dust, as did the sill of the window. Jenna thought a space like that collecting dust was a waste of a great reading spot, reminding herself that sadly not everyone read for escape and fun, or read at all these days. She took the four steps to at a time and knocked on the front door. Someone says I don't vote it's un-American. We get this a little bit when the sheriff's trying to pretend to care about her staff. At least she knew he knew she'd tried to be personable. Nowadays that's all people really expected. You didn't have to care. You only had to pretend that you did. We get a reference to Belinda uh, watching a Fox News report on the most recent mass shooting in America. And I think what's so damning about this is not only does that help with the world building, but that Lorne couldn't even name a specific mass shooting because that would date the book because so many of them happen. We get this line, you're the new Stephen King baby, getting run over is the best thing that could have ever happened to you. Which is an interesting little reference to Stephen King's accident, which he then wrote about in a bunch of his own books. So they have a drink and we get um, to fiction and the death of fan favourites. Very GRRM of you. He's a hack. And uh, after her accident, she's lost her arm and she makes love and we get this. It was hard and emotionless and eager and urgent and explosive. When he came, Lee could feel his semen inside her like a pinball striking bumpers. He bent almost in half, sandwiching her between his torso and his lap, clutched her about the shoulders as his spasms filled her. And then later on, um, she, he says, you're more than an arm to me. You could be a head on a stick and I'd still love you. Lee laughs and says, nothing but blowjobs then, lucky guy. And we just get this great line of dialogue. You really want to dig your socks from a dead woman's throat? Cracking line. And Lee kind of lies to her husband about where she's gone. And she says to him, you should have been an author. And he says, I married one. That's enough fiction for me. And this is true as well. Um, they're climbing and it says, end of summer and snow on the ground. Wherever they were going, it was high. Thousands of miles above sea level. Which was funny when you thought about it. You'd figure that the closer you got to the sun, the hotter it would be. But that wasn't the case. Belinda never had understood science. Actually thinking about it, I don't know why that's the case. We get a reference to Jeffrey Dahmer as well, which I thought was funny because this was kind of came out, I think 2018 it says. Yeah, copyright 2018. And uh, I'm reading it in 2022 when uh, the biggest series on Netflix at the moment is the Jeffrey Dahmer series. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But all in all, The Sound of Broken Ribs by Edward Lorne. It was a delightfully gory book and I do like a lot of gore. We have a lot of death in this. Um, and I mean, I guess it is, it's kind of like horror, thriller combined, um, but in a really good way. I, I don't know, they don't always work well together and, and thrillers just as a standalone, just general thrillers, don't really do it for me. But um, Lorne's writing in this, it was pretty gripping. There were a few minor errors like missing apostrophes and things like that, but nothing that really hampered my enjoyment of it. And overall, it was just a really well put together indie book. So I gave this, uh, The Sound of Broken Ribs by Edward Lorne, a solid four out of five. And I'm looking forward to seeing what my girlfriend Shay thinks about it. Shout out to Shay. So there we have it. That's what I made of The Sound of Broken Ribs by Edward Lorne. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.